Mm. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, we are welcoming you to the conversations hosted by the Research Collective for Decoloniality and Fashion. My name is Erin Kriyev, um, and normally Angela Jansen would be joining us as well, um, but today it's, it's just myself from the Research Collective of Decoloniality and Fashion. And really the aim of the series has been to experiment with alternate fashion knowledges, um, very much through communal conversation and through interdisciplinary engagement. So what is really important is that our format is really experimental, that we come to knowledge in relation with others. Um, and I think that's really important, how we come to knowledge in relation with others. We like to do listen and then join in the conversation, just being mindful that we are sharing time with one another. The conscience is therefore not a lecture series, but rather voices and experiences that we can then share. And as Sonia mentioned just now, the first 30 minutes will be recorded, and these are then made available on our YouTube channel. And after the first 30 minutes, we'll then open the room to a broader discussion that won't be recorded. So today's session, we're incredibly excited and, and, and privileged to host with Sonia a set of voices and an incredible um, set of experiences and knowledge in the room. And Sonia, I think I'm going to hand it over so you can just do a gentle and beautiful introduction to what um, the focus of today's conversation is that you've chosen to share with us. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Erica. And also for providing us this opportunity to join you. Uh, the RCDF is a very special uh, sort of group, collective. They're very inclusive and open to change. And like I said, I learned how to have conversations to just think things through, which are open-ended and not really purpose, purposed towards change in a in a forceful way but just to let the mind wander in different directions in a, in a group and i found that very beneficial and hence came the pakistan collective for decolonial practices there's a lot of people in this group it's not just me there's asia and mevish and meher and um so many others who i can't uh Zeb bilal um dr shabnam sayyad khan dr nadeem amartara they're they're a lot of people who are part of the collective and actually are the running running sort of steam engine for, for it. I'm just the front face. And uh, just to let you know again, we're only recording the first 30 minutes. Also, if you could turn your phones on silent and I shall do mine too. Uh, today's topic is to uh, explore the history of cotton in the Indus Delta and the consequent challenges to fashion in Pakistan. This is more about thinking through cotton in Pakistan as a means to reflect on indigenous dress practices and how our dress has changed from, say, a malmal dupatta to a lawn dupatta or to a lawn kurta. So that journey from malmal to lawn is what we're trying to explore. Of course, the terrain becomes extremely important. And uh, just briefly to share a few, um, uh, this, a few or sort of issues that we will crisscross through the conversations with the speakers is our, our decision to wear cotton or use blended fabric, the weather and its demands for breathable materials, uh, how cotton has become a challenging situation from seed to manufacture, and therefore discussing cotton production and the regional geography. Um, we want to also reflect, I mean, we're forced to reflect on recent climate events and dis displacement that we've seen through floods. And also maybe mishmash through the fact that the floods have been happening for centuries. So why is it, why the, the reaction that we saw recently is, is it necessary? Is it unprecedented? What's the story with that? Um, so that's, I think, going to feature in some of the talks. And this is just to reiterate that the, the British have also used our irrigation 
uh, methods um, and set them up for their for their purposes, as Shanaz Ismail, Mrs. Shanaz Ismail was just telling us, that um, chins and a lot of other cotton um, uh, cotton history, which is even preserved in the Watson catalogs, and you see how how taken the British are by our um, by our products and. Uh, and then we see a reduction of our products and there was about a 25% export to the world uh, from for start in Egypt to a lot of other, uh, there's a lot of other testimonials. And uh, after the British left in 1947, there was a 2% footprint. And that also brings me to the, to the again, I think Rafi or Meher may be touching upon this, that there are two, two ways of growing cotton. One is through rainwater and one is through uh, irrigation in America, they use rainwater. In in uh, Egypt and Pakistan and probably India, they use uh, irrigation. Also, we are speaking to some people who are experts in the field and use a lot of cotton for their companies. And one of them was recently in Pakistan. Uh, his name is Mr. Naveed Hussain. He's with one of Bangladesh's biggest exporters. And he said something quite, uh, he had said something quite uh, exciting in his um, interview to CEO magazine. And, and so I asked him about it, that is cotton really a water guzzler? And are you really thinking of hemp? And he said, absolutely. And he's been offered 25,000 acres to try and see what hemp can do. I didn't know that because it's not in the news, but, uh, and, and funnily enough, it was, he said it was at the, you know, he was in Pakistan invited to do this experiment at the behest of the Pakistan army who's interested in this. So that, that was also an eye opener. And then Dr. Gohar Ijaz posted on through the All Pakistan Textile Mills Association, that the problem is research and the lack of it and how from 15 million bales, we've gone to 5 million bales. I would like to introduce my speakers tonight. There's Mayor F. Hussain. She needs no introduction. She's the news editor for the Friday Times. She will be presenting her research on the li her life as a cotton picker. Um, there's Tofiq Pasha Miraj. Uh, he also needs no introduction. He's going to talk about cotton and alternatives seeds, I think he means, and he's a social and environmental activist. And he's, he's very well loved in Pakistan. Everybody's well known, but Pasha is very well loved in Pakistan. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto has just messaged that he's unwell. So we'll hear draining the basin another time. And Rafi is here with us, Mr. Rafi Alam, an environment lawyer. Very hard to pin down, but luck we're lucky to have him. Thank you for being here, Rafi. Uh, genetic erosion of indigenous cotton varieties in Pakistan. Thank you very much, RCDF and Erica, for having me here. Sonia for inviting me, as well as the Park Collective for Decolonial Practices. Okay, now, now cotton is a mainstay of Pakistan's economy. In any sort of cotton uh, documentary read, whether it's the uh, Pakistan Cotton Association or anything from the Ministry of Textiles, will look something like this talking about how this is a, the backbone of Pakistan's economy. And I don't need to go into the figures as such, but the figure I do want to quote is that for every million bales of cotton that Pakistan produces, there is a billion dollars of export revenue attached. And what I'm going to be talking about today is the seeds, the cotton seeds. And so these cotton seeds are part of a lucrative market. We have to understand. Now, what we're talking about is different types of cotton. You've got your conventional cotton, you've got our organic cotton, or what I'm going to refer to as Indian cotton, which is indigenous to this part of the world and goes back centuries and millennia. And then we have genetically modified cotton, which is when a scientist inserts a, 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 something alien to the seed. And the specific thing I'm going to be talking about today is Bacillus thuringius, or the Bt virus. Now, the Bt virus is otherwise found in the soil and has been used in organic cotton to cover the, the, the cotton bud so that things like bollworms and other types of pests, uh, which uh, find this virus deadly, don't attack the, the uh, cotton seed. But BT cotton means that you inject the cotton seed with the virus itself. So as the plant grows, every part of the plant, the stalk, the bud, the stems, they all contain a bit of the BT virus. And the promise of BT cotton is that you will have fewer pests, 
and you don't have to invest in pesticides. So some of your input costs go down and you're insured a greater uh, harvest or a greater yield. And this is the promise of BT cotton put forward by multinationals that have patented BT cotton like Monsanto um, and so on. Now, all genetically modified organisms in the world or what I call living modified organisms uh, operate under what's known as the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. It's a huge document, but essentially it revolves on two things. Because there are so many different applications of genetically modified organisms, be it in cotton, be it in food, it could be in medicine, um, you need to be able to assess the risk of putting something alien into nature. And once you assess those risks and you know what they are, you need to be able to mitigate those so that they don't cause greater damage. And those are the two principles upon which the Cartagena Protocol are based. And it's also the principles upon which, because Pakistan is a signatory to the Cartagena Protocol, it's the basis of what's known as the Pakistan Biosafety Rules that were passed in 2005. They attempt to make sure that we have risk assessment and risk mitigation. They do so by having this three-tier system of institutional biosafety committees, various organizations around Pakistan, be they in medicine, in agriculture, they experiment with genetically modified organisms. Now it's called a, and they, each one of these institutions have a committee that assesses, that practices these risk assessments and risk mitigation practices. For every institution working on GMOs, once they feel they have something that's worthy of commercial licenses, they push it up a flagpole of sorts, which starts with the technical advisory committee, and then eventually with the national biosafety committee, which is supposed to grant licenses for GMOs to be able to be commercially operative here in Pakistan. This is the regulatory framework on paper that we have in Pakistan to control GMOs such as BT cotton. Now, BT cotton was introduced into Pakistan in 2005 in an unregulated way, I tell you this. And it wasn't until 2014 that the first batch of licenses for BT cotton were granted. I'm over here showing you a list of the members of, of the National Biosafety Committee that convened in March 2014 to grant 16 licenses or 16 different entities licenses for the commercial production and use of BT cotton. There are three major problems with GMO regulation in Pakistan. And the first is a conflict of interest. And I'm quoting from these minutes, where I say paragraph 52, where it was explained to the applicants that work had started before the approval of the National Biosafety Committee. And all members of the National Biosafety Committee agreed to discourage such practices of institutes, especially by organizations which are members of the Technical Advisory Committee and the National Biosafety Committee. And if you look at the, the, the list of members on the left, number three, the chairman of the Pakistan Agriculture Research Council has a conflict of interest because the PARC itself was seeking licenses for BT cotton. And the minutes themselves reveal that there is a conflict of interest going on over here. Not just that, but look at this, where the TAC had not recommended the approval of laboratory genetic manipulation work on rice, as it's a main export crop of Pakistan. What had happened here was that a ban had been imposed by the, by, by the EU on genetic modification work in Pakistan after receiving complaints from the European Union about contamination of GM rice consignments coming from Pakistan, which means that unlicensed GM products in Pakistan because of vested interests are working here without the relevant risk assessment and risk mitigation protocols of the Cartagena protocol. The other problem with genetically modified BT cotton uh, in Pakistan is what we call the lack of or low BT expression. Uh, the amount of BT virus required in the crop to make sure that things like ballworms die. This particular lack of or low BT expression had been discussed in the National Biosafety Committee meeting uh, in 2014, in paragraph 12 there on the left-hand side. And the evidence of the fact that low BT expression has been a cause for low yields of cotton in Pakistan comes from a letter written by the Director General of Agriculture Research in Pakistan in 2014. I'll just read paragraphs two and three on the right-hand side over here. 
The survey conducted by scientists of research wing and laboratory tests using quantitative ELISA confirmed that high infestation of pink ballworm was due to low levels of Bt toxin in early planted crops after 90 days of sowing. And look at paragraph three. The survey also indicated that most of the fields of non-BT seed had become mixed with BT varieties. And that's because we were not using the proper risk mitigation pro protocols necessary to prevent what's called genetic movement and genetic erosion that has taken place in Pakistan and has infected local varieties of crops. The third issue is a legal one, which has to do with the devolution of responsibilities of governance due to the 18th Amendment which brought down things like the Cartagena Protocol's responsibility to the provincial level. And in Punjab in 2014, their own biosafety rules were passed. Now, I have no problem with the Punjab passing its own biosafety rules, but it creates an overlapping forum with the federal government and the National Biosafety Committee and a Punjab Biosafety Committee, both granting licenses for genetically modified organisms. We went to court on this, absolutely. We took this to court where we sued the government of Pakistan for the failure of the regulatory mechanism and the director general of the Pakistan EPA admitted that there was a problem in GMO regulation. We won that case. Look at that last paragraph. It says the petitioner is satisfied with this statement and the director general uh, and the statement of the director general. That meant that no GMO or BT cotton should have been allowed in Pakistan after 2014. But the government of Pakistan went into appeal. That appeal is still pending. And as a result, we have genetically modified seeds in Pakistan have taken over all the natural seeds or natural cotton seeds in Pakistan. And I just want to end by the fact or the statement here on the bottom right that the promise of BT cotton and its high yields have proven incorrect because the highest yield of cotton in Pakistan in recent history was in 2004 when natural cotton was sown. BT cotton has never produced more cotton than natural cotton in Pakistan. Where it's easy enough to blame climate change for the low, uh, for, for low yields. But the fact is we have a very poor regulatory system that has been infected by vested interests, which is one of the reasons why we've had genetic erosion and have lost indigenous Indian cotton in Pakistan. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Rafi. That was really awesome. Uh, the research and the way you presented the cases are, uh, I see that working without protocols is a problem in every year. Uh, every field and quickly we will do the question answers later can we go to uh meher if you're here please um this is basically about what a cotton picker in pakistan lives like so without further ado let's carry on um some of the images here are graphic i tried to reach out to photographers who did actually go into the field and photograph the cotton pickers but they're too traumatized by what they've seen and they refuse to speak about it Perhaps one day they might be able to share what they, they've got. Here's the case study of Muksuda Mai. Her story was picked up by the BBC. In 2015, uh, it marked 50 years of cotton picking in her life. She is one of the 500,000 women cotton pickers in Pakistan. She started as a child. She is illiterate and she lives, sleeps on the same land where the cotton is grown. That's how closely connected these communities are with the soil. Cotton pickers are hired at a daily wage rate of 50 pence or 64 pence. Just let that sink in, that's not even one pound. And a good day of picking 40 kilograms of cotton means that they earn up to 96 pence. As Rafi pointed out, uh, cotton is the backbone of Pakistan's economy. But here's the thing, in the fashion supply chain, it doesn't matter how ethical some brand may be, it doesn't matter what they're claiming, these cotton pickers are nowhere to be seen, identified, there's absolutely zero awareness of who they are and the conditions that they work and live in. Um, what the, if that doesn't shock you enough, it's the environmental stresses that the developed world is producing that is taking a toll in Pakistan. And the sad part is that whether it's climate change, whether it's vested interests, whether it's legislation, whether it's regulation or the lack of it, ultimately it is that these female cotton pickers are paying the price 
and they have absolutely no say because they are not acknowledged, they're not recognized, they're never mentioned anywhere along the supply chain at all. Why is this important? As the world consumes more and more fashion, fast, we've seen the rise of fast fashion, there's more demand for cotton and therefore more yield. And while Rafi is correct in saying that genetically modified seeds do not produce more yield, what you're seeing is there's more stress on cotton growers to produce them. So you have things such as pesticides that are being used. Now, pesticides, some people might say, oh, it's a good thing, it's a really good thing, there's nothing wrong with it. Well, yes, but if you're the one living on the land, if you're the one living amongst the fields and you are drinking the same water and you are picking the cotton, this is what happens. The residue transfers to unborn children and they develop all sorts of deformities and mental health issues. Again, something that is never acknowledged by anyone in the fashion industry or globally. Pakistan contributes less than 1% of global emissions, yet it is paying for the first world's consumption. In 2022, Pakistan saw devastating floods in which the cotton picker paid the highest price because they didn't just lose their homes, they also lost their only source of livelihood. Bear in mind, these are women who have had no education, none whatsoever. Any documentation they have to sign, they have to sign using their thumb. When will the fashion industry begin to understand the plight of these women? When will they be acknowledged is the main question. These are victims of exploitation, disease, inequality, and systemic abuse at every level. I had suggested to the London College of Fashion where I did this presentation that perhaps it's time that consumers of fashion or users of fashion actually began to empathize. And the proposal was to create a virtual reality film where maybe if there was some form of experience of what these women go through, then perhaps people would understand what their, uh, what, the, what their daily life is like. Um, the diseases that these women live with, the danger that these women face, there's a severe lack of social justice and it's about time that this was understood. Empathy is free, but the labor is not. And there's a desperate need to value the labor and to value these women's lives because frankly speaking, why, why are their lives any less than anyone else's? There's a list of references here if anybody's interested in reading more about it um, and what can be Thank done. Thank you so much. Um... I think that's uh, the way you've put it is um, it's a sombering moment for us all. And truly, we're very close to the cotton belt and there is no uh, sort of uh, acknowledgement of these laborers and their work, uh, which uh, has gone. Well, I think it's about time that, um, you know, you have to understand that the fashion cycle, which is global, and of course, it is linked to colonization as well. I think it's high time that these laborers were acknowledged because that's at least one of the steps that we can begin to decolonize yes. fashion and understand that fashion is intrinsically linked with gender, with social justice, with economic equality. So we'll come to the question Q and A later. I'm sure I've noted my question down and I'm sure everybody else has, but uh, for the recording, which is just the first half hour, we'll go to Pasha. Is Mr. Tawfiq Pasha Moraj here, please? Would you like to... Uh, Come on. Yes, Good evening. Hello, everyone. Thank you for um, inviting me to be here. Um, Rafi Alam, of course, as usual, um, bombarded us with all the legal um, and factual uh, information. Um, the, the presentation we heard about the cotton pickers um was brilliant um and like sonia when we were talking earlier on i i had said that you know uh, we grew up with the country in western music and there was a lot of songs there um singing about the cotton pickers and the cotton pickers uh cotton picking is a is a horrible dirty miserable job it's 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 cotton has grown where there is this it's hard it's uh, dusty, it's dry, their hands get severely uh, chapped and cut. Uh, it's a horrible job. And um, um, also what we must realize is that these women, um, 
don't only pick cotton. They pick cotton because cotton is picked at a particular time of the year. Um, last year, a cotton crop in Sin was destroyed because of, of the flood. But it's, it's that two-month window, three-month, two-and-a-half-month window, three-month window when you are picking cotton. Then they move from cotton, they move to other crops, and they even, these women also harvest sugarcane, which is yet another horrible job. And uh, they have just finished harvesting uh, wheat, which, again, the, the way we harvest wheat, where they, the woman uh, squats on the ground with a sickle in her hand, and she's just cutting it and laying it down, and then it's collected after it's dried up some. So uh, and we are very backward in our agricultural practices in Pakistan. Uh, very unfortunate because our backbone was agriculture and we were, we still are an agricultural um, based country. Our significant part of our GDP is uh, um, uh, agriculture. Now, I am an activist and, and uh, um, uh, whether it's uh, social or environmental, but um, I'm also a grower. I've been a grower all my life. I, I've just come back from one of the farms and I am growing cotton there right now. Um, but I'm also growing sugarcane. I'm also growing mangoes and a lot of other crops. Um, one of the things that I have done uh, all my life is, is to try and find alternative crops. Um, so a lot of the cotton sugarcane that we were growing uh, on this particular farm was reduced and we started growing roses, um, which was, if nothing else, it was, it was better picking for the women than uh, uh, the cotton. But I also um, came across, I've known it all my life, there's a, there's a local uh, cotton plant that grows in our garden and everybody has it and I call it an indigenous cotton. Um, in my little bit of research, I haven't exactly been able to identify it, um, but it's a cotton which is, its growing habit is completely different to the, the uh, uh, cultivated cotton today. Cultivated cotton has an eight month season. This grows forever and ever and ever. I've had 10, 15, 20 year old. It grows into a medium sized tree. It sheds cotton a major part of the year. It never needs any fertilizer and it doesn't need any spray. Um, so, and I have grown a significant amount of cultivated cotton as well for many years. I know the footprint of um, the amount of water cotton consumes, the amount of fertilizer, it consumes and it's all chemicals that we are using, whether it's the fertilizer or, or the sprays. And it's a constant, and with BT, it's a constant battle uh, with all the genetically modified uh, uh, produce. There's a timetable. You have to be very specifically giving uh, um, uh, fertilizers and spraying pesticides at, at specific times. It, it can't grow without those. Now, from what I understand, this old cotton was, was not very popular because it had a lot of seed and the staple was not long enough. And that is how, so we did, humans did that research on, and we've improved the quality of the grain or whatever the producers, because we've done it with bananas, we've done it with tomatoes, we've done it with everything. And as we've improved, certain qualities that we require, we have been losing nutrient value. So the grain may be bigger, there may be more grain per, per plant, um, more weight, but the nutrient value is decreasing. The tomatoes may, be, may have more shelf life. The strawberries that today we grow in Pakistan, they stay on push carts out in the sun for three days and nothing happens to the strawberry. How can a strawberry last? for three days and 30 degree temperatures out on the street and not get spoiled. So what you lose is the quality of the produce. We could very easily have improved maybe the quality of that cotton or how we use that cotton. So we could have adapted to the cotton rather than make the cotton adapt to us. 
because in doing that, we have created chemical changes in our environment. Um, from, from what I understand, um, hemp rope is one of the first ropes that was used when we were using alternate power. We were using wind power and hemp ropes to, to ferry across the ocean thousands of years ago. Somewhere down the line, our need um, uh, grew so quickly because of the population growth that the easy way to increase our yields was to use pesticides, go into hybrids, and then go into genetically modified to be able to ensure the crops and the quantity of crops we require. So we have to go back. It is having to go back to the drawing board. We have to go back to the beginning. We have to figure out how it is that we can use the existing uh, varieties to get better produce and to adapt to them or alternate uh, materials. We got stuck on petrol, diesel, and coal. We didn't look for an alternate fuel after that. That was good enough for us. Mm -hmm. We speak 7,000 languages around the globe. Could we not come up with five more uh, fuels or five more fabrics to wear? And cotton is a natural choice for people who come from hot climates. So we, an alternate has to be something similar, but there are so many alternatives available. So um, this is what I have to say. I am always available to share any of the experiences, any, any of what I have seen. Uh, if anybody wants, you can please always message me through uh, the organization and I would be more than willing to share uh, what I know and what I experience. Thank, thank you. you. I'll be Sir. open to any questions. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for also for, for keeping the time and, and stay here because I've noted a few questions too for you. But